It's 100 years since women could become barristers for the first time. It's a momentous milestone. So why are women leaving the bar? I'm Stephanie Haywood, a barrister, and I want to know if the obstacles of 1919 still exist in 2019. On December the 23rd, 1919, Parliament passed the Sex Disqualification Removal Act, which opened the legal professions to women. In the years leading up to the Act, women's attempts to enter the legal professions were blocked. In 1913, the Court of Appeal decided a woman was not a person. There has been significant progression, and statistics reflect equal numbers of men and women qualify at the bar each year. Yet five years after qualifying, numbers of women decline and never recover. Women represent 37.1% of the whole bar. The bar is mostly self-employed, meaning barristers belong to chambers and are given work by clerks. A smaller proportion of the bar is employed, meaning a barrister works for an organisation. At the self-employed bar, just 35.1% are women. Five years after qualifying, this falls to 34.5%, and after 15 years, to 30.4%. These worrying statistics mean that in the senior ranks of the bar, only 16% of Queen's Council, a mark of excellence awarded after years in practice, are women. With some working conditions incompatible with family life, discrimination and harassment and bullying prevalent in the legal profession, are the struggles of women today mirroring the pioneers of the past? Helena Normanton was the first woman to practice as a barrister. She became well known in the suffrage movement and used her notoriety to speak about women and the bar. She published a book, wrote articles, and in 1918, after her first application to become a barrister was rejected, argued that there was no reasonable ground why admission to the bar should not be granted to women on the same terms as men. To learn more about the history of women's attempts to enter the legal professions, I'm meeting historian Mary Takayanagi. Various women made attempts to enter the legal profession during the late 19th century, but there were two important test cases that happened in the early 20th century, and this was Bertha Cave, who attempted to become a barrister in 1903, and Gwyneth Bebb, who attempted to become a solicitor in 1913. Bertha Cave brought her case uh, to Gray's Inn in uh, 1903, where she asked to be admitted, and Gray's Inn said no, and she appealed. Her case was heard by the Lord Chancellor, the Lord Chief Justice, and other judges in the House of Lords of all places, and she came as a litigant in person and argued her case but the whole thing was over in 10 minutes or so. They denied her entry to Gray's Inn uh, on the grounds that she was a woman, that no woman had previously been admitted to any of the inns of court and uh, legislation would be needed um, to rectify the situation. Gwyneth Bebb tried the same argument 10 years later. The Court of Appeal said in the case of Gwyneth Bebb versus the Law Society that a woman was not a person for this purpose and therefore could not become a solicitor. Why is it that they didn't wish to set a precedent? What was underpinning that? Attitudes to women were very different 100 years ago. It was seen as inappropriate for women to enter professions because they were seen as not intelligent enough, not intellectual enough to, um, uh, to put forward arguments such as a lawyer would have to do, a solicitor or a barrister. Women were seen as too emotional to argue cases, to put, uh, not logical enough to put cases together. It was also argued that men would find it very difficult if they came up against a woman in court, that their natural chivalry and gallantry would take over, um, and uh, that women would use their feminine wiles to try and get around men in court. Now, these arguments have been explored by Katie Broomfield, who has explained that, in fact, underlying this is a very deep layer of misogyny and fear of women, because uh, what, ultimately what these male lawyers did not want was competition. Was the opposition also because women's roles were to be childbearers? There was a, a strong ideology in the early, late 19th, early 20th century of separate spheres and the idea that uh, the women's sphere was a domestic one, the home, children, childbearing uh, and uh, cheap teaching and educating possibly, whereas the male sphere was uh, the public sphere um, in politics and in, in imperialism. This was the age of empire, of course. Today, research shows that female barristers are far more likely to have primary caring responsibilities for children. Nikki Alderson, author of Raising the Bar, 
left the bar in 2018 after difficulty balancing the demands of practice with three children. The second time when I went off with my second child, that time I had 12 months off and I returned when I felt more ready. But when I went back, I did feel that there was a um, communication issues, shall we say, between me and my clerks, where I was explaining I'd had a year off, it would be great to be eased back in to the job because obviously confidence is, a, is at a different level. Your practice has by then changed because solicitors know you've been off and um, you have to re-establish yourself. Um, and asked for a few bits and bobs for the first week or so. And within 24 hours of returning to Chambers, I was given a Section 18 wounding where the defendant had smashed a glass and twisted it into the face of the complainant and he was left blinded. I was given a murder, junior brief, fair enough. And I was also given a rape where my client was just 13 years old. Serious cases. Absolutely, and not what I had imagined within my first 24 hours of going back in terms of being eased back into the job that I'd been out of for 12 months. Did you communicate that? I did communicate, yeah. I, <laughs> I refer to this in my book when I've written about these sort of issues that it's one thing saying it, but it's about being understood by the other person as well. Communication is absolutely key and clerks really are a very important part of all of this. But unless they hear and understand what you're trying to say, then it's difficult to make it work. In 2016, the Bar Standards Board launched a survey to investigate the retention of women. It also addressed the effectiveness of the equality rules, which became mandatory in 2012 and required chambers to have flexible working and parental leave policies in place. Women were asked about their experiences of flexible working and returning to the Bar after maternity leave. Dr Davies, a number of respondents in the survey um, described having issues with um, applying to work flexibly. What were some of those issues? Well, um, in some chambers, it was simply viewed as not possible or practical but to, to practice, for example, part-time, um, less than a full working week. Uh, additionally, even if people were able to uh, work flexibly, they found that their quality of their work deteriorated. Another problem, and this goes to the, if you like, the business model within Chambers, people working uh, part-time were not necessarily offered reductions in their rents, and so, of course, that's going to make it um, financially um, much less of a feasible proposition. I think probably the other one, and this is, this is potentially systemic, is that people, particularly in criminal practice, found it very, very difficult um, uh, explaining to a judge that actually you don't work the next day if the, the, the trial needs to run on that's not going to be a very easy thing to, thing to do. Dr Davies the survey asked women about their experiences returning to the bar after taking a period of maternity leave now being self-employed there's going to be some degree of financial impact at least when you don't work for a period of time what other uh, issues did women experience after returning to the bar? So plenty of them did experience a drop-off uh, off in work and it taking a long time to get back up to previous levels of, of practice. To be clear, we require Chambers to have a policy to deal with maternity leave, but nonetheless, um, people did experience negative things coming back. And the sorts of things that people would tell us that was that, for example, they were treated very poorly after the birth of a child um, by their chambers, no real planning for when they were getting back, um, and actually um, much less work. Um, in one particular barrister told us, and I quote, no one spoke to me for a year after I returned. Um, the expectation was that I wouldn't, I wouldn't cope and I would disappear off. There are systemic factors that make part-time work difficult, but the responses in the survey reveal attitudinal concerns that may be impacting on retention. If some women are taken less seriously or left to disappear off after having children, this creates a culture which finds it hard to accommodate competing demands like family. Consequently, some women found that working part-time was just not viable at the self-employed bar and left altogether. One woman said, I found it impossible to return to private practice after my first child because the bar could not accommodate my working anything less than full-time. The responses chime with 2017's Back to the Bar survey, which investigated why barristers, particularly women, left the self-employed bar on the Western circuit. In the previous six years, most women apparently left mid-career. Almost all men retired or became judges. 
61% of women found it difficult to return to the bar after taking childcare breaks. In October 2019, the Western Circuit Women's Forum released best practice guidance to help chambers to support barristers on parental leave. It recommends agenda-based meetings, imaginative responses to flexible working, and a longer rent-free period to minimise financial challenge. Chris Henley was chair of the Criminal Bar Association until August 2019. He used the platform of a weekly email called The Monday Message to highlight the problem with being a woman at the criminal bar. I asked him how he tried to change practices to make life easier for women. So one of the things that I wanted to encourage was, or, or put in place, supported by the Bar Council, but resisted so far by the judiciary, um, was an email protocol which meant that there comes a time in the evening when you're not expected to respond to emails, whoever they come from, professional opponents or the judges or, or whatever it is. There need to be some rules about that. I mean, I think there are now at the family bar, but there should be at the criminal bar. And the same through weekends. We're not constantly available. We're not, that's not how practice should be. Same with sitting times. Sitting times are basically when the judge comes through the door. Yes. So um, there has been real sitting hours creep. Um, so when I started, 10.30 tended to be the, the norm. People might gasp and say, you know, what kind of job starts at 10.30? But of course, the job doesn't start at 10.30. The, the job often starts at 6 o'clock in the morning, preparing for the day, travelling to wherever the court is. I mean, often if it's, if it's quite a distance, you'll be on a train not long after 6 o'clock in the morning. You have to go and see your client who might be in the cells. You might have to speak to members of the family. You have to find your professional opponent. Most people will arrive at court at least an hour or so before the court starts. And increasingly, courts are sitting at 9.30, which means that people have to get to court by 8.30, which means that people are travelling, um, sometimes for an hour or more, leaving home shortly after 7 o'clock on a very regular basis. How that stacks up with young children, uh, I just don't know. And those are the conversations that I've had with the senior judiciary. I mean, and the, the inevitable consequence of that, particularly with fees being too low and listing often being sent out at 4 or 5 o'clock the day before or diaries being adjusted late the previous afternoon, how are people supposed to plan and how how are people supposed to pay for the childcare which you need to wrap around your working day? If you have predictable hours, then you can make choices, you can make sensible choices, you can predict how your work, how your work is going to be during a particular week. The judiciary has so far said, no, it's a matter for individual judges, the judges are coming under incredible pressure, and if at four o'clock a judge says, oh, we're running a bit behind, we need to sit at 9.30 tomorrow, it shouldn't fall on perhaps a, a young practitioner to say, but that just doesn't work for me. Instead, people just have to feel that they have to suck it up and life becomes very difficult. And you, you only need two or three of those and you start thinking, I, you know, you become so demoralized, you've become very stressed. What do we do then? What's the solution? Well, I, th I think that right across from top to bottom, there needs to be, I mean, I've thought about this generally for the criminal bar, there almost needs to be a, a crisis summit addressing some of these issues. But until people recognise the problem and want to own the change, we're not going to, we're not going to make the progress, which is why I wanted people to feel uncomfortable, not just in this message, but in others that I wrote, to try and, you know, they might not like me for saying it, but I want them at least to be thinking about it. Another issue affecting women is discrimination. It is significant that Nikki Alderson's practice was largely sex offence work. It, it was wall to wall, um, historic child sex cases. It, it was a choice I made, but under the guidance of the clerks, because we had an annual practice review meeting where you'd talk about your expectations for your practice. And I think there was a, a large expectation because we had a lot of um, these sort of cases in chambers that, well, that women would do those. I think too often uh, chambers are not thinking strategically about the development of um, individual members' practices. And I think Chambers feel are, are not good at, uh, at being honest about their discriminatory, often, usually I imagine unconscious, but discriminatory practices in the terms of the allocation of work, the introduction of young female practitioners to solicitors, and the sort of lazy stereotyping of, oh, they wanted a man, 
or O oh, murders and terrorist cases should be um, undertaken by men and sex cases should be undertaken by women. And, you know, it's interesting that sex work tends not to be paid as well as murder and terrorism, so who ends up doing the sex cases? It's women. Who ends up doing the, the big frauds, which, to be honest, are much, much easier. Many days can pass when you're not doing very much. Whereas, if you're doing a, a rape case, there's no spare time. It's, it's full on every single day and it's emotionally really grueling and if you get stuck doing that sort of work because of these lazy misogynistic practices um, after a while plenty of people are going to say I just can't do this anymore. In a Times newspaper article published on October the 24th 2019 Karen Monaghan QC observed that in the Supreme Court the persistent underrepresentation of women was likely to do with straightforward prejudice and stereotyping. She said, solicitors and clients too often choose men to represent them because they thought they would have more gravitas. Men therefore appear in greater numbers. So I think the only way to address this is for chambers to introduce policies whereby they look at where the work is going in a very hard-headed and honest way and say, this needs to change. The underrepresentation of women leads to imbalances of power which permits bullying and harassment to thrive, observe Lynn Townley and Her Honour Judge Callie Cool QC in a report published by the Association of Women Barristers. In a global survey, the International Bar Association revealed that one in two women experience bullying and one in three sexual harassment in the legal profession. At the bar, the Association of Women Barristers said inappropriate behaviour in court still abounds. Women are expected to be charming, funny and feminine, and if a woman presented a full-on personality, she was often branded aggressive or strident. A fear culture inhibited barristers from speaking out, challenging or reporting bullying and harassment. To overcome this problem, the Bar Council has joined forces with SPOT, an online tool where barristers can confidentially report inappropriate moments at work. Baroness Kennedy, the Association of Women and Barristers released a report very recently, October 2019, um, and it alluded to the fact that there is still a fear culture around challenging harassment, bullying at the bar. Two years after Me Too, Time's Up, global movements, why do you think that's still the case at the bar? Um, when you're dependent on others for um, uh, the next brief, um, or for being chosen to be a junior in a big trial, um, or where getting the reference for something, um, being spoken well of to solicitors so you get more work. Uh, you don't want to cross people. And so it means that people can end up accepting um, really uh, unpleasant sexual innuendo, commenting on, uh, on, on how you look, um, invasive, unpleasant uh, undermining that, um, that, uh, that you just cannot take that uh, to any higher authority without being fearful of the consequences to your own practice and to your own ambition. In order to effect a change though, is exposure, calling it out there and then, the only way to do it? I mean, how do we empower women to well, do that? Well, yeah, one of the things that I'm doing now is that when, um, um, you know, I recently wrote extensively on this business about how the business of changing the workplace, renegotiating our relationships, men and women, uh, changing the way in which uh, our society operates, it has to be a job for men and women both. It's not good enough. We, we've been doing this as women on our own, um, calling out bad behaviour for quite a long time now. And I actually think that it's something that we have to do in, you know, together. And there are plenty of men who know this goes on. And what I'm saying to, to male colleagues and to men in parliament and to uh, my sons and to everybody is, you know, when, when men speak in derogatory ways about women, where it's their, their tits and their behinds and their, uh, the rest of them, it's the source of, of, of conversation, it, they have to be saying, that's not a way to be talking about women. I don't like it. You know, they have to start being the people who call this out. And it, hasn't, it mustn't be left to us. People all complain about the Me Too movement. My disappointment was that so many older women said, oh, come on, we all had to put up with that and it didn't, you know, nobody died. And we, and we just had to slap them down. It shouldn't be part of a woman's professional life or her working life, whether it's at the bar or whether it's uh, on the 
you know, shop floor. It shouldn't be part of a young of a woman's life, and we have to um, be in solidarity with younger women. It stops happening to you at a certain point in your life, but for young women, it's still a hellish part of what they have to put up with, and it shouldn't be the case. And it actually denies them the professionalism. It's a way in which they lose confidence about about what they're doing. The Bar Council has recently worked with an online tool called Spot. Do you think that will help? Communities tend to be very protective of their reputation or of the people they like and so forth. For example, law firms uh, or sets of chambers fear for the, the, their own reputations as, as small institutions. And that's where you get cover-up, that's where you get bad practice, is that reputation is put ahead of uh, uh, of the individual's um, misery and the thing that's happened to them. And, uh, and so that's the, the difficulty. You have to have a pact made um, in law firms, in sets of chambers, that in fact when a complaint is made and it's clear that it, it, it's a justifiable complaint and that somebody was um, behaving in unacceptable, uh, oppressive ways, then um, I'm afraid it doesn't matter what the, the loss of earnings to a, a business might be, those people have to be moved on. And so we have to, ch we're challenging culture and culture is very hard. It is a great privilege to be a barrister and to advocate for a variety of people. That is why retention matters, because the bar must reflect the society it serves. The centenary is a time to celebrate the journey of women in law, but there are still some outdated practices that are impacting on retention. Perhaps the biggest issue is balancing the demands of practice with family life. Women leaving for this reason preserves the separation between these worlds, which is arguably reminiscent of the past. Ultimately, pioneers like Helena Normanton did not strive for change so that a century later women would be leaving the bar. If there's one thing we can learn from the past, it's that change can happen as long as we have the courage to keep seeking it. Mm -hmm.